Is this on? Yeah. Oh, okay. good, Harry. You're good. Cool. Um, all right. So uh, Ken pretty much stole all the thunder from the first slide. <clears throat> <laughs> uh, so, uh, like I said, or like you said, software engineer by day. Uh, this is a this is a computer that I work on. Uh, it's there's 27,000 computers in that room. It's a billion times faster than your smartphone, and it's 10 years old and considered really slow. Uh, the next one that we're building is about um, 100,000 times faster, and they tell me it can do 8 million tweets per second. That's yours and mine's uh, tax dollars at work for the government. <laughs> uh, this is our farm uh, right here. Uh, well, the eastern side of it, you can see the rotational grazing going on with our sheep. And then uh, the field of family. So that's a couple of years old. Uh, the daughter on the left there, she's taking a permit test on Monday. So I'm more, you know, <clears throat> more afraid of that than I am of public speaking. <laughs> uh, so here is. Here's our, uh, let me turn this over here so I can look too. Here's just some of the things we do on our farm. Uh, top left is our, uh, just some customers. We love having people at our farm. We think having people to see your food is a really great thing. Uh, just here, that's the turkey that we grew accidentally too large. We keep our turkeys <laughs> normal sizes now. Um, and then uh, we have um, hens on pasture for eggs. And then this, these are our sheep. It's a, it's a heritage breed called Tunis. And their dual purpose, we sell grass fed lamb and some uh, fiber from them. We also raise some livestock guardian dogs. Uh, puppies are all lined up in a row that wasn't staged. Uh, there's no way you could do that with nine puppies in. Um, but then also broilers and a couple of kids in embarrassing chicken costumes when they're kids. They wouldn't leave me alone when I was uh, building the talk, so I told them to put embarrassing pictures of them <laughs> in the day or in the talk. Uh, they also raise some pet bunnies, which apparently there's in. Uh, unending uh, demand for, uh, and so since you can breed them very quickly, they, uh, they uh, make a killing on that. Um, you know, they spend it on all. But, uh, <laughs> but they have a lot of fun with that as well. Uh, as Kent said, he's uh, the, uh, the better half of this project. Uh, if you don't recognize him, he was just here 30 seconds ago and introduced the talk. Uh, I consider him a crazy smart farmer, educator, and farmer mentor. If you're new to SFA like I was a couple years ago, my wife and I, I think, cornered him in that corner after one of his talks and demanded that he come to our farm and tell us how to farm. Not I, I wish that was my track. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's, he's got a couple sessions today if you're, uh, uh, if you're uh, looking at programming. I uh, highly suggest that you listen to everything he says. I found a couple pictures of him on the internet, including this one. Apparently, there's some guy named Ken Solberg in Wisconsin who's an industrial designer and designed an autonomous self driving tractor. I didn't see any pictures of that guy, so I'm just assuming it's you. <laughs> so he's multi talented, you know, crazy, you know, soil health, and uh, self driving tractor. Uh, acknowledgements for this, this is part of a Sustainable Agriculture Demonstration Grant. Um, if you go down to the MBA table, I'm sure they can tell you about it. And you can look at the Green Book, which is all online, but also all the projects from the Green Book. Uh, you have to do a report, and you end of your report for this, and so you'll see ours from last year in there. Um, it's a two to three year grant, and it supports innovative on-farm research and demonstrations. I take that as just any crazy idea that you think you want the uh, government to spend money on, go for it and write a grant. It has to be multi-year, so this was a two-year grant. You can't just do one, and you can get up to 25,000 funds. They just started this year with 50,000, like an extra 25 matching. I don't know what that's all about, but uh, you can read about it. Uh, it's not for infrastructure. It's not for fencing or water. It's for crazy ideas. Um, and there's a lot of money available each year, but the proposal deadline is already, already passed. So, as I see it, you have 10 months to figure out uh, something to get paid for. And it's unique in that you, re you uh, are required to have a farmer and a technical collaborator. In this case, I'm the farmer, Kent is the technical guy. And you're also required to have a field day in your final year. Uh, so we use our field day as a, uh, as a, uh, a farm tour for the Central SFA chapter as well, and uh, dual purpose as well as our customer customer appreciation day for our farm as well. All right, so what is pasture poultry? I'm sure most of you uh, are familiar with this. If you're not, basically frequent moves in a chicken tractor, which is a bottomless structure, it's moved around the pasture. 
Uh, I can't remember who I heard say this, but the birds in a pasture situation eat steak, bread, and salad, meaning bugs feed and greens on pasture. The uh, fertilizer, the manure that they put down is considered fertilizer on the pasture, it's not a waste stream. Uh, and typically in the system you would see them following a rotation of greatest animal like a uh, sheep or a cow. The cow's sheep would eat the pasture down, knock it down, and, and uh, keep the forage at a level that's um, more amenable to poultry. Typically these are smaller scale operations in comparison to um, how big chicken operations can get in the United States. And uh, I think maybe the largest thing about it, the, the thing that really drew me to it is that it lets chickens be chickens. If you listen to Salatin talk about this, uh, he talks about the chickens of the chicken, and this is a situation where they're on pasture, they can scratch and, and the forage, and, and it's more of their natural, um, natural habitat. So this is Joel here. I think most of you are probably familiar with him and his tractors for for just uh, definitions, uh, I consider this, for, for this talk, to be mobile confinement. I think that's somewhat of an oxymoron because they're moving around and, and we're letting chickens be chickens, but uh, we're just trying to say that they're always confined by a tractor in this case. So this is our control setup for the experiment that we're going to do. And you can see, uh, you know, he has them out on pasture here and it's moving them uh, uh, at least once a day. So we call that uh, full-time mobile confinement. Um, day ranging, on the other hand, is a little bit more nuanced and a little bit harder to define. For our uh, experiment, uh, this is uh, my farm and, and the experiment, we consider day ranging to be a paddock that gets moved and there will be a tractor that the birds are actually confined to at night. So it's not fully free range. I've seen uh, a lot of people talk about day ranging and free ranging and use those terms intermittently. So feel free to do that if you like, it's nuanced, but uh, for the purposes of this talk, we aren't free ranging. So they will always be uh, somewhat contained in a fence and also at night put up in a shelter, in this case, just a, a regular chicken tractor. Uh, so look at that, or compare that to the right. This is Luke Gross's farm in English, Indiana. He has a day ranging setup, and that is just a structure, a shade shelter that he pulls through his um, pastures, but he still has the uh, Premier One fence that he keeps them in a paddock. So just the motivation of where did I hear about day ranging, I, well, where I hear about most of you uh, farming things, either SFA or YouTube. Uh, and so I was listening to a podcast, a grass fed life podcast, if any of you have uh, listened to that with Darby Simpson. And they were talking to this guy, Greg Burns from Nature's Simmons Farm. I believe he's in Ohio. And he talked about, yeah, I just put all the, I put everything together and, uh, and day range and it's great and made all kinds of uh, claims about it. And that got me kind of excited. The second thing is this is actually. Diego right here from the Grassroot Life Podcast, and this is the Gross from Gross Family Farms. If you, if, by the way, if you ever want to know what a good farm Instagram feed looks like, check out his Instagram site. Uh, it's pretty awesome. But uh, you know, they you see on a uh, on a video like this, it's a it's a nice, really long interview uh, that he talks about his system, which is. A rotation within a Premier One fence, and he raises Freedom Rangers, um, and is very simple with a just a tow, you know, pull behind shelter. In this case, it's just some uh, two by fours on skids and an upside down pickup truck bed longer, uh, and and then he carts the feeders and stuff around. Um, so I, I think he was making similar, you know, a lot of different claims as well. And so I was getting kind of excited about this as a new chicken farmer, and just thinking about regular old put them in the tractor and do it like Sal does, right? Uh, and so they made a lot of claims anywhere from you know the chickens just seem happier, um, the livestock welfare uh, is is higher, and being less prone to disease. Uh, Great birds talked about his Cornish. He believed they found it out more than the birds that he did uh, when uh, just regular uh, time the tractor. Uh, Luke Gross talked about the 
he didn't like how much manure would concentrate in a tractor, even when he did move it. And he liked the idea that they, uh, he felt the birds had more access to forage uh, because they were given a, a larger area to range in. And again, from a marketing perspective, uh, if you look at his Instagram or his website, he liked that the birds apparently stayed cleaner. His waters and everything stayed cleaner because there wasn't birds usually roosting on top of them and, and soiling water. Uh, and then he liked having people come to his farm and see birds that were running around. Uh, and that's something that, that I resonated with as well. We like to have people on our farm and, like, and they like to see pictures like uh, this of birds running around in the pasture. They don't necessarily want to see them inside of the tractor. Um, and then the last thing I just found actually while I was preparing for this talk, uh, a grant, a SARE grant from I think five or ten years ago, uh, and this one was a little bit more on my alley in terms of uh, just showing some more data and economic type factors. Um, they were able to, or the, the project that they did, they used day ranging as a way to feed their birds fewer times per day. Uh, and so that uh, ended up in less labor. Uh, they showed that their birds actually grew bigger. And they felt that from a marketing perspective, they could charge more for their birds because they were uh, free range. And again, I'll put free range in quotes uh, there. So uh, I read this book and I reread it when I was preparing for this grant. And I said, well, what does what Salatin say? Right? And I think all of you know he's a, a very opinionated fellow. And he has his uh, way that he does it. And it's certainly working for him. There's no way uh, that you could deny that. Uh, and, you know, he's not talking about the specific way that we did day ranging in this project, but he still has uh, certainly some things to say because he's tried this. Uh, and so he talks about a floor pen, which we don't have, but still a pen where the birds free range during the day uh, has disadvantages, especially with corn across. And the biggest thing is they're lazy, right? Or maybe they're just unable to range. And, and his opinion is, or his experience, I should say, is they just won't walk. Uh, enough to find and eat a fresh pasture. If the birds are moved every day, then uh, you get them to range on pasture without uh, them really having to do any work for them. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, so, in your in your experiment, did you did you use the uh, Cornish crop broiler or something else? Um, we used we used both actually. So. Use what? We used uh, free rangers and Cornish cross. So I'll get to that in a second. Okay, well, I'm just because that that has a lot to do with whether you use the, the, this kind of pen or have uh, the other way. Mm -hmm. you, have, you have Cornish cross, you might as well have them put their where you want. Mm -hmm. Sure, so we'll, I'll show uh, what we did in our experience in a second. Uh, so, uh, as uh, you know, uh, Joel has a lot to say. Uh, so he even has a whole chapter, another chapter later in the book, about shortcuts. And, and he uh, considers, um, well, I guess, anything that's not his system uh, to be somewhat of a shortcut. But the two things that he says when you do something like day ranging and free ranging is that he believes the birds just won't consume as much forage, right? Uh, and also said that disease becomes more of a problem uh, and you just can't expect the same uh, performance when you're not being able to get unlimited fresh forage, right? So unlimited fresh forage for him is moving the tractor and always giving them enough underneath their feet. And to some of these other folks that I've been listening to, unlimited fresh forage is give them enough space to go do it, right? And so I said, all right, uh, which system is better for broilers, farmers, and consumers? And these are the things we're going to look at. Uh, and so I put better in quotation marks because I think we all have a different context. So it's possible that one of these is a pro and one of them is a con uh, for one farm versus the other. Then I said, hey, what does Solberg say? <laughs> <laughs> and I think he made the mistake of giving me uh, his phone number at uh, the SFA conference here a couple years ago. And he said, well, why don't you write a grant and find out? Uh, so that's what we did. <clears throat> Uh, so between our farm and uh, Kent's work and SFA uh, and getting the funding from the Department of Agriculture, we uh, set out to compare these two. 
Um, all right, so I'm an engineer. I know engineers and farmers both love acronyms. I'll keep mine to two letters uh, in this talk. On the left side here, uh, we have uh, full time. So this is literally just a chicken tractor. Uh, and we're going to move birds through pastures with just that chicken tractor. On the right side is uh, DR, that stands for day rangers, and actually both of the both of the the full time, which is this tractor here, and the day ranger are right next to each other. I put this picture in just to show that they were side by side, literally in the pasture for the entire experiment. Um, and so this is the day ranging system where we have a fence. Um, you can faintly see that there's a little post here. That's where the electrical, uh, where the electric fence is hooked up to it. So we charge that fence. Uh, and the birds were able to range uh, out from there. So this would have been the first year with Cornish Cross, and you can see they're, they're out there, they range. Um, so this is this, uh, this experiment that we set out to do, and the different <coughs> experimental factors, right? So the, the main thing would be, what are we varying, and that would be pasture access. So the day rangers and the full-timers uh, are gonna have a different amount of pasture that they're available to them at one time. And then in 2018, we did Cornish Cross. When I was looking at writing this grant, I thought, I thought how do I get this into a two-year grant? Uh, well, we'll just do another breed of chickens for a second. Uh, so we ended up doing Freedom Rangers, uh, all males. And so one of the reasons I did and picked those two is because the grant needs to be relevant to Minnesota farmers and agriculture. And these are uh, two breeds that are grown within the East Central SFA membership. And so I wanted my results to be relevant to them, but I also wanted to get all of their wisdom about how to grow these uh, specific ones in my area. Uh, and then we did this experiment, repeated it again in the spring and the fall, so we started around May and August 1st. So that totals up between the two years, two batches, and two different pasture access management models to eight different uh, batches of birds. So the controls were the brooder, all the birds were together in the brooder, and they went out to pasture on the same day, and they went to the processor on the same day. Um, so we kept them all together, and then we separated them when we set them out to pasture and sorted through them so that their weights were about the same once they entered uh, into the tractors on pasture. They ate the same feed, a Luxembourg uh, transitional organic and corn and soy feed. Uh, we kept 40, we're, we targeted 45 birds in each one of of those uh, tractors. The tractors were the same. The sheep went through the pasture first and uh, knocked it down. Uh, and no bird was ever on the same piece of land as any other bird in the entire experiment. We had enough land to do those eight batches where um, no batch in the second year would have been affected by um, anything that would have happened on uh, the pasture from the previous year. Uh, the weather technically was a control when you consider that it was side by side. Obviously, the weather was different for each season and each year, so that wasn't a control over the entire thing. Um, and maybe the most important would be equal pasture. So, they're, like I said, they were on pasture for the same amount of time. And then the total amount of pasture that they had access to, oh, had access to over their entire life uh, on pasture was the same by square footage. And I spent way too long in PowerPoint trying to, <laughs> trying to build this. But, uh, so this is the, if you uh, imagine the square footage, the footprint of one of, of my tractors. And so for the full-time group, uh, you know, on day one all the way through day 14, we just move them once a day. And then starting on day 15, and then uh, you can see we started moving them twice a day. So the total amount of pasture that they had was those moves once a day for 14 days and then twice a day for, for uh, three weeks. Um, so that's five weeks on pasture for, and this is for Cornish. It was a little bit different for the Freedom Rangers because they were on pasture for a little longer. Uh, now compare that to the Day Rangers. Uh, these guys were in one paddock for a week and their tractor was moved every day. So it moved seven days. Um, it, it was never moved twice a day. And at the end of the week, the whole system moved over to the next paddock that was of the equal size. So over the course of their lifetime, all the square footage of this day ranging group was exactly the same as the full time. The only difference is that the day rangers had, had access to one fifth of the total pasture for a week versus full timers who had access to just the size of the tractor per day or twice per day. So we moved that fence um, and the energizer, that's my uh, 
That's my lightning bolt too. Um, what's that? Did you move uh, the the day rangers? You, you moved their house every every day. We did. Yeah. Originally, I wasn't planning to do that. I was hoping to reduce the amount of paper by just leaving it one spot and moving it once a week. But there's way too much manure. Okay. <clears throat> All right, I don't know if this will work, but my son and I uh, got Legos and a uh, got Legos and an app, a stop motion app, to show how we uh, how we move tractors. So this is the day ranging system. It's a Scovich tractor. He wanted to put a lot of the chicken chasing in because he's used to that. <laughs> So that's how you put day rangers in in their tractor, and then you head off to your barn, grab the full timers. Um, this only took like two hours to do, <laughs> and I think we made four different videos. Full timers, they go in, take a little rest, <laughs> off to do other farm chores, uh, and then so this one will be the move of the day rangers at the end of the week, day seven. So, come on a barn, get over the fence, um, <laughs> chase that chicken back in, and the rangers tend to escape sometimes. So the, the full-time move is pretty simple, right? Um, you're, you're still just moving it up and down the pasture. Anyone who's fought with the, uh, with, um, Free marijuana fence knows that it can take a little bit of time to move those. Um, it's also not easy to get a Lego guy over a fence, so we, <laughs> we tried our best to keep at least one section of the fence the same as what the next paddock was, so that you could hopefully uh, spend a little less time doing that. Neighbor's horse also came over. Um, and so, just moving the fence, um, foreshadowing the next. Uh, slide here. This is going to be the most time-consuming part of of the day ranging system is is uh, moving paddocks. You need to sell that to put here. Instructional <laughs> <laughs> um, video. Yeah. So and then obviously you take a rest, enjoy the stars. I'm good. <laughs> How big were the paddocks was yeah. the question. I don't remember. Um, I have the report. I have a couple copies here that I can hand out, but otherwise it'll be in the green book. The report will be otherwise come up to the end. I'll give you your email address. I'll just send it. I can email it to you. How many birds per paddock? So the birds per paddock were each one of the tractors had 45 in them, and so the same amount was in the energy paddock. Um, That's good one. the paddocks one? 160 foot roll of fencing or two? Yeah, it was one. one. Yeah. All right, so housing. Uh, I used a John Siskovitz chicken tractor uh, for the entire project. Um, and I learned a little bit about scaling up an operation here. They're kind of expensive to build. Uh, I, have, I have a new farm, and the previous owner didn't leave me any worthwhile construction materials. Uh, on the back 40. Um, so I built these from scratch with all the materials, and they cost about $365 if I track of all that um, for the grant, obviously. Um, and they're about 70 square foot each, and we put 45 birds in there. If you, if you get John Siskovich's book here, he recommends more like 40 birds per tractor, but we didn't have any problems, I think, when they were full size doing 45, especially with the day rangers. They didn't spend all their time in it. Um, it took about 33 hours for me to build them, uh, and I, I built them simultaneously. I didn't do start to finish, start to finish. I built all the components together and assembled them together. Uh, and so a lot of people have asked me, why didn't you just build a salad tractor? And I think there's just as many uh, tractor designs out there as there are farmers. Um, and uh, so the, the things I liked about this is that, one, I can't stand up in it, but I can certainly crouch very minimally and get inside of it, and that's important for me. I didn't really want to lean over on things, so that's just from a comfort perspective. Uh, two, it's light enough that you can pull it by yourself, and my 
12 and 14 year old daughters can pull them as well. And so I really liked uh, that. Um, I also had already built one of these for, uh, for our layers and just attached a, a couple of nest boxes on the back of it. So again, engineering mindset, two is one, one is none. If something were to happen to one of these during the, during the grant, I could just, the layers can go in the coop for a little while and I can swap it out. Um, they're also multi-species. I grow turkeys in them. We have brooded chicks in them. And I can tow them from one side of the farm to the other side of the farm with an ATV uh, really easily. Um, and yeah, so I like them. Growing our farm and our operation, I won't use any more of them. They're just too expensive and don't hold my But that's what we use for, for this year. All right, so we're always in 25 minutes. Let's start talking about results. Uh, so Cornish Cross and Freedom Rangers, those are the two different years. You'll see all my acronyms in this data. So first, uh, we looked at the labor. I don't think it was any surprise that the data rangers took more time uh, in all instances than, uh, than the full-time systems, regardless of, of season, regardless of breed. Obviously, the breed here doesn't uh, make too much of a difference. And this is really just talking about the time it took to go out and do the daily chores. So this isn't a full amount of time it took to raise a chicken from from Dale chick to to uh, you know selling. This is uh, nothing having to do with the brooder walking up to pasture and keep track of that. Basically, I had a cell phone app that had different different uh, you know, jobs on it. Each one of these batches was a different job. I just hit start and then I would move them like you saw in the Lego guy and uh, and then I'd water I'd water them and then I'd feed them and the, the reason I did it in that order is because when you move them they get fresh grass or they get um, they get taken out uh, the door gets opened on the day rangers and they get time to forage while I'm doing other things and so we try to optimize their when they're the hungriest <laughs> to be spending that time on pasture and you know honestly that's only a couple of minutes but it still in my opinion makes a difference. Um, so anywhere from 20 to 40 percent more time would be just your time where you're doing the daily chores, and the most, the, the you know the percentage difference there is is mostly that weekly move. It would take anywhere from uh, when you're really good at it in the fall of 2019 and had learned to set up the pastures correctly uh, instead of the, actually setting up the fencing, the access to. Uh, water and, and electrical correctly, um, we could get that down to five minutes sometimes. Uh, otherwise, it could be as many as 20 or 25 minutes. Uh, and also, you have to remember that the birds should be in the tractor when you're going to move the fence, right? So, um, other things that took more time, you can see uh, red arrows pointing at some troublemakers here that get out when they're young. This typically only happens the first week that they're out in pasture, they grow and they're not able to get to the fence. I think there's there's certainly ways to mitigate this. One is just experience, and, and two, I mean, Premier One has a new fence that has like a mesh around the bottom where the young ones can't get out. So spending, I think, an extra twenty dollars on that would basically make that problem go. Away. Can I ask you another question? Absolutely. Did you have the the fencing around the the uh, Confined ones as well as the, the free range? Uh, the question was was there a fence around the full time group? No. They were just, just that. Yep, Tom. So <laughs> these are the times you spent on each group of 45 chickens? Total over That's the total. many total, weeks. Total over the top one would have been five weeks, the bottom one would have been. About seven weeks. Okay, but uh, that seems, uh, 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 no doubt it's accurate, that seems like a lot of labor to pay for from the profit of 45 chickens. Would, would, they, would that change much if you had six groups of 45 in each of those? So that's certainly one thing that I'd love to uh, see what happens when you scale it up because as you scale these things up, you're spending less and less time on each tractor, right? So this is worst case scenario. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All 
but actually it looks like a poor case. <laughs> uh, if you're working for free, labor is cheap. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, the major differences here is that, from a labor perspective, that it pays to have experienced people, right? So, the last 2019, you have six and four, six hours and 43 minutes. Remember, that was six hours and 43 minutes over the course of, uh, of, of chickens that were on pasture for 10 or 12 days longer than the 2018 fall for four hours and 47 minutes, right? So again, this every one of these birds was in a different pasture, they're in a different place, and so as you get used to your farm, or if you're you know, going to do the system, you'll find the areas, or you'll say, I need water there, um, in order so that I'm not spending so much time doing this or doing that. So this is very context sensitive, right? But um, I think that it will be hard pressed to be able to do day ranging with the same amount of labor unless you're going to start taking taking back uh, and making concessions on what you uh, on how you're going to manage them. All right, so predation. Um, there's a lot of different predator strategies. There's prayer, <laughs> hope, um, poorly clovers, livestock guardian dogs. Uh, like I said, we we have livestock guardian dogs. The, the first year of the um, of the grant or of the, the project here. Uh, our dog was just a puppy, she wasn't part of this. And so, while making things equal, we made sure that the dogs were not part of a predator protection in any way. We wanted it just to be poor birds out on pasture and they have, some, one, one of them has electricity to save them, the other just has a track. Uh, luckily, we didn't lose anything over the course of these two years, and that wasn't for lack of predators trying. So, uh, you know, this is, this is uh, the security camera on the side of my barn with the fox checking things out. This is a hawk sitting in a red pine just viewing the chickens. <laughs> <laughs> Never made it uh, to, to get any of them. And, and it's a, certainly a big concern for day ranging because they're exposed to aerial predators. Uh, we have plenty of bald eagles and plenty of hawks circling all the time. None of them really seem to want to give it a shot. Mm -hmm. um, we lost things on the farm during this, including these two turkeys down here. We lost layer hens as well that were on a pasture in a Siskovitz tractor. Uh, day ranging. And they were day ranging. So we didn't lose anything from our meat birds, but we did, uh, we did have some, some, uh, some issues. What the were farm. they lost to? Fox. 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 Yeah. Uh, we, we, to this day, have never had a known aerial predator attack or have seen any um, any evidence of that. I mean, if it's a perfect attack, you should never know until you take them the processor when you're a couple short. Right? <clears throat> um, again, this is really, really dependent on your farm. Um, we, I, I, the, the scientist in me would love to have results to show you or something, but the farmer in me is really glad that none of them come to you. All right, so just uh, along the predation and livestock uh, um, animal welfare, we didn't lose very much either in the brooder. Um, I think all of our brooder losses were pretty much as expected. Again, this wasn't really part of the experiment, what happened in the brooder, but just for just for uh, the sake of reporting, we did lose seven here, and, and we got between 92 and 96 from the hatcheries. Uh, the Cornish Cross came from Well Hatchery, and the Freedom Readers came from Freedom Reader Hatchery in Pennsylvania. So these seven that we lost, there was a little mix up with the post offices that we sometimes it was also pretty early in the year and they were being shipped from Pennsylvania. Um, but otherwise, that mortality even was only 7% uh, and we lost very few otherwise. We also lost, you know, almost nothing on, on pasture as well. And like I said, we were targeting 45 birds by the, uh, by the end of where we started and and we only lost, I think, uh, we probably do the math here based on what we started, but we lost two or three. I ran over one with a chicken tractor, which is, you know, you really hit yourself when you do that, just an accident. Um, but with the Cornish, there was more of this, uh, you know, there's a little bit of cannibalism we saw as we were taking the processor. We lost them on the way to the processor. Uh, and then in this fall batch, you know, they went out, they're a week or two old when September comes around. So there was some piling on. Um, 
all I can really say is the Freedom Rangers were great. They're very resilient birds. They can get a little pushy at the end. You can start to hear a couple of weak sounding crows coming out of them, and it's kind of kind of interesting to hear. But in, in general, they're very resilient uh, in the brooder, as well as, I mean, despite the seven number, very resilient in the brooder as well as uh, pasture. In this case, uh, we lost one in the brooder, and then the other 91 survived. So um, I can't say enough about them. Obviously, I'm trying to stay objective about it. All right, so that's too many tables and numbers. We'll look at a couple pictures. This is basically how we uh, weighed them. In the next slide, I'll show that, uh, their performance. Uh, we weighed them. The trick here is if you're going to put a chicken in a bucket, put it on its back while it's trying to figure out uh, where it is. You can get a weight reading for them, and then they write themselves and are perfectly able to be picked up and put into a crate. Uh, the second thing about this picture is this is what a Cisco extractor looks like after a windstorm. Um, you're going to spend money on tarps if you use these tractors. Uh, and then this is my daughter, Elsa, she's really cute. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so feed consumption. I'm sorry about the busyness of this slide. If you really want to ingest it, come and find me. I'll send you a link to the, to the paper. Um, basically, we took and kept track of everything they ate. And we weighed them uh, at the finish. And so this is mostly uh, just the last two columns, I think, are, are the interesting part of feed conversion ratio. and, and for. Our purposes, this is the number of pounds of feed, feed that it took to make one pound of live weight chicken. So this is what they would have weighed when we took them to the process. Uh, Salatin reported a two to one, or a, a FCR of two. Uh, so that's obviously totally unfair because I wasn't able to get anywhere close to that. But he's, uh, you know, different birds, different climate, uh, and he's doing what, I, what we're calling here full time. Uh, the interesting thing here uh, from these from these numbers over here is that day rangers actually showed up or ended up being more feed efficient than uh, than their full time counterparts, um, unless you're at Cornish Cross in the spring. So that actually was an increase in the in the feed conversion ratio. And we didn't design this experiment to look for the mechanisms of so these things. It was more just to report them. Uh, so I can make a lot of guesses as to what's happening here, but maybe the Cornish cross aren't as feathered out as green rangers and their you know, extra activity and the colder season, they just needed more feed and ended up not being able to grow as much. You can see that that group consumed more feed, uh, about half a pound more per bird, and then they were down, uh, what, 0.2 pounds on their finished weight. So that all starts to add up. Um, the fall batches, as expected, they consumed less feed than the spring ones, um, and there could be many reasons for that, right? Um, just more forage, more bugs available, could be that it's just warmer. Um, I'd like to think that the day rangers had more access to pasture, and possibly depending on whether it was their, the Freedom Ranger or the Cornish Cross breed, they still had more availability to go eat whatever they want than they when they want it. Um, just from an observational standpoint, the idea of Cornish cross being too lethargic to go and range, I think, is not true of the birds that I had. They were out on pasture all the time. They didn't care about rain, they didn't care about us being, well, they obviously loved us being out there once they realized that we bring the food. <laughs> but um, for the most part, I, I, I have heard and have seen a lot of people talk about Cornish cross being too too big to get up, or, or they won't range or something, and I just didn't really find that true of the birds that we got. Um, so the difference in the ability to to forage, I don't know if that's as big of a factor here as um, maybe we would expect. Uh, I think the last thing is uh, that a fall day ranging Freedom Ranger is almost as speed efficient as a spring day ranging Cornus Cross, so that's the difference between this uh, 3.05 and the 2.99 there, they're, they're getting there pretty close. I think my my assumptions from the start was is that a Freedom Ranger would never be uh, in the same uh, same category as a Cornish, but you know, in this case, they're on pasture for a little longer, they eat, they eat more, and their weights were higher. 
So it's not quite catching up to the Cornish, but it's really in the ballpark. Which do you prefer now that you've done this? Uh, we're going to go for your main uses. Okay. <laughs> It's oh. the, the, how old were they when they went out of pasture? Three weeks. Three weeks? Well, we intended to take them out on day 21, but the nature always has different plants, especially in the spring. So most of them were out before day 24. Well, they're all out before day 24, but we targeted two weeks. Yeah. What was your feeding schedule for them? Like, did you feed them twice a day, once a day? Did they have feed in front of them? All the time, twice a day. Okay. Um, in those first weeks on pasture, well, in the brooder they had feed from them all the time. Uh, in in those first weeks, we would feed them first thing in the morning, and basically once we saw that when we went out in the afternoon and that was already gone, then we started feeding twice a twice a day. Uh, we did not keep feed in front of them all the time. Your average finished weight is live weight, though. Yes, it's live. Um, so the last thing I'll say about that is that day rangers act as a cleanup crew. They do not mind eating yesterday's leftovers. So when you move that tractor, they will find where it was yesterday, the day before, the day before that, and they will clean it up completely. Uh, so maybe all of our assumptions or, or my guess is that why uh, they were more feed efficient um, <clears throat> are just wrong and maybe they're just more feed efficient because they waste less. So this could be an exercise in make sure you get feeders that waste as little as possible. Um, I use the feeders that Siskovich has in his book which are essentially a, I think a four inch PVC pipe with the top third cut off that has, you know, has a bit of a lip on it so they don't waste a lot in my opinion. Um, but these birds would be here and they would be scratching up and they would be eating everything. And, and the full-timers, they didn't have this possibility, right? Once they moved, they never had access to that feed that they would have spilled yesterday. So I have lots of pictures of day rangers doing their thing, and then a, a group of them just eating left over. All right, <clears throat> too many numbers, let's look at some more pictures. This is Siskovich tractors in uh, a insulated, a uh, shop with a concrete floor. I would not recommend this. They, I think I had three uh, heat lamps in each one of those to try and keep them warm, and then you know, barn cats on <laughs> patrol all the time. Uh, as opposed to the, I didn't mention it when I was here, but this is our, this was our field day. Kent would have been standing right there. Sorry, I had to cut you out for space. <laughs> no problem. Um, this is our Ohio brooder, and there's 175 watt and 250 watt lamp in there. And we did all 95 of them in that one Ohio brooder, and it was great. So I can't say uh, enough good things about an Ohio brooder um, as compared to trying to do something like this. I mean, I had tarps on top of tarps on top of tarps trying to keep them warm, and it was pretty difficult to do that. So we, we scrapped that pretty quickly. Um, this picture here would have been uh, this past November. The birds uh, finished up, I think, on October 9th. And I just wanted to show, this is basically the footprint of what happened. This would be the full timers going up and then back and up and back here. And, and so you see the greener pasture there on that side. And footprint over here, this would be a day ranger. So, uh, you know, this I think would have been second week on pasture. You can see individual tractor moves and then another sort of cell there, another cell. So I think you've got one, two, three, four, five, six. The first week would have been here for their roughly seven weeks on pasture. Um, <clears throat> so that's just kind of the difference that you see in terms of the deposition of manure and, and how, they're, how they're fertilizing the pastures as you go. Know. How much time do you have? You got 20, yeah, 20, 24 minutes. 20 minutes. Not good. I can talk for <laughs> All right, so nutrition. So uh, this was probably one of the parts that I was most excited about. I, I saw this grant as the ability to get the state to pay for nutritional testing. My stuff, that's where... We're, I mean, my wife and I were pretty passionate about that when it comes to raising this food. We want to make sure that it, that it meets all of the, the promises that we hear about pasture raised meat. Uh, so what we did is we took 10 birds out of every one of those 45-ish samples, and we took a breast and a thigh from each of those 10 birds. We didn't take 10 where it could have possibly have been you know, two breasts from the same bird. 
uh, it was really fun, you know, explaining that to the processor of how we wanted all of this. And they, were, they were both super nice about it, but you could tell they were like, "How long is this grant? Just two years?" <laughs> <laughs> um, so we took thigh and breast samples. We were sent off to uh, a laboratory in the cities. It's the same lab that Land Lakes uh, runs uh, over in Arden Hills. And uh, we just tested a few things that, from the literature, we look at and see those are those are quantities that are known to be more um, uh, beneficial, I guess, for human nutrition that come from pasture pasture raised meats. Uh, we chose thigh and breast samples mostly because I like chicken thighs the best, but also we were able to find USDA reference values for the nutrition. So I'd like to try and convince, or I'm sorry, compare apples to apples here, and so we're doing that with the cut of meat, but I don't really know what the chickens from those USD reference samples come from. I'm going to guess, based on the results, that it's not a pasture-raised bird, more than likely a, a hybrid Cornish cross of some sort, but I wasn't able to find, even emailed them and asked them if they could tell me, never go back, um, just to get an idea of what it was exactly that we're comparing to. Um, but I think we probably are okay in assuming that it's a Cornish cross and a, a large, uh, in a confinement operation. Go ahead. Did you try getting some chickens from the grocery store and comparing the samples to see if they were the same? Like something that's said natural or something that's said? If they were the same as the USDA reference or just you adding that? The samples of the, the, the pasture poultry to something that was commercially raised and you could buy those chickens in a grocery store and compare them. I didn't. I, I didn't do that. There's a study um, by Mike Badger, 2015. Um, and I believe you can find it on the APPPA website. Um, that did that, and so they took pasture-raised birds. They did like an organic from a grocery store, and then I think just whatever they could find at the grocery store, and they did a comparison there. Was it were the tests different? Or did it all test all the same? Were the results different? Right, the results of the test. Yes, they're very different. Okay, so if you go into a grocery store and you buy a natural bird or some bird that's a natural, and then you have it tested, can you compare it, can you tell if in fact it wasn't raised natural, even though it was labeled wrong? Well, naturally doesn't really have any... No, I understand. Uh, it, it doesn't really mean anything. I think that if you tested a pasture-raised bird and non-pasture-raised bird, you'll see from the next slide, you'll be able to tell for sure. My point is, that are they marketing stuff also? That's why I was wondering. I think all food marketing is <laughs> buyer beware. So it pays to be educated, and that's, I mean, in all honesty, that's what. Well, I mean, that's if, if what a manufacturer is making a false claim, you should be able to. Yeah, well, so they can use terms like all natural because it doesn't have a definition. You can make it be whatever you want. Yeah, I, I get your point. Well, and a lot of the terms like pasture and things like that too, I mean, if you go and look at what the standard for what it has to be to be called pastured, it's not what most consumers imagine pastured actually is. So you have to take that into account too that um, what we're doing and calling pastured is likely far beyond what a lot of what you would find at the grocery store. Go ahead. So natural is actually defined in the standard of identity, but pasture is not. Okay. So that's where we can have that. Um, by the way, so it's up to the farmer to define what pasture is. So that's that's a great point because that's why we have a farm day every year. When 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 people ask what pasture it is, I give them a YouTube video, I give them a picture, and I give them a tour. And I say, this is what I mean when I say pasture. And now I now I have nutritional results to tell them this is. So what were those nutritional results? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's look at cholesterol. I think most of us know what that is. Uh, um, there's no difference in particle size here. You just get one number from the uh, from the lab. Free range is considerably higher than what you would get from uh, the Cornish cross, and those Cornish cross are about the same as. Um, in, you know, slightly higher than on average than we get from the USDA. So anywhere from 32 to 50 percent higher in the uh, uh, with the freedom readers. And uh, I, I'm not really here to comment on nutritional analysis so much to determine why that's the case. Uh, it is the 
I think, as far as I can tell, this is the first time I've seen these numbers from a freedom region. Um, vitamin E, on the other hand, was something that I did not expect because vitamin E is well known for being uh, being higher in more of your red meats uh, and pasture-raised meats. I wasn't really able to find a lot of uh, other literature that talked about it in poultry, but it's a for human nutrition, it's a major antioxidant, and you know, if you're worried about cholesterol from freedom rangers, you can look and see that the vitamin E will inhibit bad cholesterol damage, and it's much higher in freedom rangers, so I don't know if that really means anything. Uh, uh, but um, overall, 233 to 500% higher on vitamin E from a pasture-raised bird, which I think is pretty cool. Um, didn't really see any type of seasonal difference or management style difference for the cholesterol, and not so much of a management style or uh, seasonal difference with the vitamin E. There are differences, but they don't necessarily all follow a significant trend. The only trend is that they're considerably higher than the USDA reference. So if you had a chicken breast, it was two or three hundred grams, uh, you would be getting roughly a, a third or more of your vitamin E from the pasture bird. Uh, and in general, for vitamin E, the full time was was higher than day range unit, except for uh, except for this guy right here, 2019. So your your uh, free rangers had higher cholesterol, but also a little bit higher vitamin E. That's the yep. Do you think that's due to the? Additional two weeks on pasture? Could be. Add sunlight, uh, Could be. Uh, I don't know a lot about vitamin E and if that's something that they would get from pasture grasses themselves. So if that's the case, then it could be. Um, it, I think what we'll see from these results is that it's very dependent. Like you are what, you're, what you eat, so you are what your birds eat, right? And so what's available in their feed and what's available in their pasture is very much the controlling factor in, in what's here. Lots of questions. Go ahead. Um, just a ballpark of cost on getting this sort of nutrition test done? Lots. Um, <laughs> over half of our grant money was for nutrition mm -hmm. tests. Wow. Wow. Well, and we did eight tests. They were about $1,300 a piece. Wow. And I wanted to get like the USDA nutrition label, right? And that was like ten thousand. <laughs> so use your grant money wisely. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I'm a mobile poultry processor, and what I find with the feeder rangers is they are always the most bad when I'm poultry. Um, then the broilers. Is this a plant? <laughs> what? Let's, let's talk about fat. Generally, <laughs> <laughs> um, the carcass is fat here. Yeah. The and it was here. Yeah. Um, and then, so I discovered if, the if you can't, Sorry, hold on. If you can't hear, you said that freedom rangers are generally higher than fat just when you're looking at while you're processing them. Yes. We're going to help us out here. Okay. Um, and then I ran into Culture King this year. Which had a had a length of time on the Freedom Ranger, but the carcass was more similar to a Cornish cross and it had less fat. And that was the kosher king. Kosher king. Okay. Cool. Um, you that? I, I, yeah. <clears throat> Do you want to come down here and, and uh, talk at the end? You have a lot to say. I don't know if I can repeat it all. Basically, you talked about a kosher king uh, as. Uh, I'm sorry, it had more of the... It had it. The carcass size is very similar to a broiler. To a, you know, what we to a Cornish. Cornish yeah. okay. okay. crop. Broiler. And the fat, the length of growth time is very similar to a freedom ranger, mm -hmm. but the fat on the bird is less. Okay. And um, red rangers don't have internal fat as much as a uh, Cornish crop. Okay. Um, so, I think that uh, your experience is bared out here in the results. The Freedom Rangers had, and total fat would be the top line here, Freedom Rangers had higher total fats than the Cornish, and um, in general, like I, I referenced a study before, the AAPP 
the A study from Mike Badger, uh, all of their fat values were lower than the USDA, uh, assuming Cornish in that case as well. Um, <clears throat> in this case, we start to see a little bit more of a variation in spring versus fall, spring being lower. Management style, the day rangers tend to be lower than the full time. Um, and all this with the caveat of what I put in the red box here. That does not follow the trend that the other seven did. And so I'm uh, going to just probably consider that to be a sampling error of some sort. Uh, I don't want to try and make guesses about why that's the case. It's just you see very, very uh, calm or very um, good correlation between, not correlation, but you see the trends between these three, between breed, season, and management style, perfectly in the in the Freedom Rangers and also within these three, but that one just doesn't fit the mark. Um, so these numbers where you see less 35 to 80 and 19 to 75 percent less, that 80 percent and 75 are from this batch. So I would probably temper that down in terms of I don't even know. I feel like a like a chicken that is eighty percent less fat probably is also not as easy to cook and doesn't taste as good. Can I? Uh, did you were these all? Uh, did did you try any that were pure male and pure female? No, we just did a random sample. Actually, the uh, the freedom rangers were all males and the Cornish cross were a straight run. But as for how many of those Cornish cross were males or females that made it in the sampling, we let the processor pick out which ones were going to be uh, sampled. And for the Freedom Rangers, we picked out the ones that we sampled, but we, we didn't like pick out the big ones or anything. Uh -huh. We just grabbed 10 and threw them in the box. And, and well, my experience is that the, the hens put on a whole lot more fat than the roosters. I, I just had experience with the Cornish crops, mm -hmm. and I would pull out, because we were uh, selling them by the bird, we didn't care how much they weighed, I would pull out handfuls of fat out of the pen. From the but they were much healthier than the uh, than food. Mm -hmm. Is there a hand over here? Yeah, what was your, uh, what was your feed again from Luxembourg? It was the transitional organic, no corn, no soy. Is that right, John? John's my feed guy. Awesome. <laughs> All right, so starting to see some trends there from breed season and the mansion style. Uh, the last thing we did was look at omega-3 and omega-6, and specifically the ratio there. Omega-3 is a very important uh, piece, specifically in the last couple of decades, we've learned a lot more about it. It's, uh, it's a polyunsaturated fatty acid, and it has many different health qualities that particularly help with resistance to various diseases. Uh, we talk a lot about omega-6 to omega-3 being the ratio is just way too high. The standard American diet typically has a ratio overall of 15 to 1, which or 10 to 15 to 1, which is very similar to what a, pasture, or a, a USD reference value is for those chickens. Um, you start to see that ratio be more in the 1 to 1 area when you're getting down to anything, anything seafood salmon, tuna, stuff like that, and then it's pretty low, one and a half to three to one for grass-fed lamb and grass-fed beef. Uh, chicken uh, is not necessarily like you can see here, 15, 14.8 to one is not known for being a, a, to have that little ratio. And a lot of people think, well, we just got to reduce our omega-6s. That's, that's not what you want to do. You want to increase your omega-3s to get that ratio down. So a lower ratio here is, is uh, better. Uh, the top line pretty much shows uh, our results. This was just added in for, um, it, there's, there's a lot more in the report, and I, uh, I'm not going to really talk about EPA, DHA, and that payout here. But uh, again, Freedom Rangers, you're seeing they have higher cholesterol and they have higher fat, and they also have uh, higher values of these different fatty acids, and as a result of having higher omega 3s, then their ratios of omega 6 to omega 3 is going down. Um, uh, Cornish cross uh, is interesting. The the seasonality of it is swapped for Freedom Ranges versus Cornish. So the spring 
had lower values for the um, for the Freedom Rangers, um, but at higher values for the Cornish. Uh, and in general, Day Rangers had a smaller, uh, uh, a shorter ratio. That could mean possibly that they're, they're able to get uh, more of these fatty acids, uh, omega-3s from the pasture themselves. Um, having a, so last thing I'll say is the APPA study of 2015, they did a little bit more looking into this and found that the absence of soy in their feed is what brought these values down. Soy is a, uh, I believe, a, like 10 or 12 to 1 just uh, in soybean oil itself. Uh, I don't know about soy meal. But just the absence of that and the inclusion of other things, which, correct me if I'm wrong, John, we have fish meal and flax meal, uh, linseed meal. So there's different components, and all those different components, specifically a fish meal, would have a considerable amount more omega threes in it. Huh? Uh, I, I I think you said it already, but but uh, remind me again, how many birds were sampled for each of those uh, six to three ratios? Ten. Yeah. Ten birds from each batch. So, okay. Thank you. So ten out of the forty-five in each batch were were sampled. All right. How much time? We got seven. Okay, so profitability. Uh, I'll try and do this as quick as I can. Uh, base cost. This column right here shows what it costs to buy the buy the chick, mail it to me, what it costs to feed it, and then four dollars a bird to process it. That's what I consider my base cost. I know there's a lot of other things that go into uh, a chicken, including transportation and feeders and waters and stuff like that. I didn't didn't consider that uh, here. This is taking the data from a couple of slides back, which would have been uh, their feed conversion ratio and their weights, and plugging that number in and saying uh, with how much it costs me for feed, uh, how much it costs to raise those. So that's just, this is just the bird, right? Uh, now, the second column, we're gonna add the infrastructure. So that includes adding a chicken tractor and assuming that chicken tractor will last 10 years and do three batches a year. <coughs> Um, I actually included the cost of extra tarps in there as well, because that's going to be a thing you do with Cisco Ridge. But if you get an electric fence, uh, uh, the same ones that we use at Premier One, and you get uh, a nice plug-in style fencer, um, and add that cost, you're going to be adding that for the day ranging batches only, you start to see where the cost difference really starts to catch up with you. Uh, even though the performance of the different different batches cause quite a variation in price anyway. Uh, in this case, like day rangers, you're adding anywhere, you know, around 13, 15 cents just for the infrastructure. Whereas a full time, you're only adding about five cents. And I'm sorry, these are all per pound. So if you are looking at a per pound, a dollar per pound to grow, it's five cents per pound to have a chicken tractor over the course of 10 years. It's 15 cents per pound over the course of 10 years to add a fence and to add a, um, an electric fence to that. And again, this doesn't consider other costs uh, like like transportation or or feeders and waters and, and various other things that you have to do with these chickens. Um, I thought that that was fair to use 10 years. I think the Cisco tractors are, are made very well. Again, they still have some components that are more or less um, disposable, like a tarp. So I tried to account for that as well. Now, what we were talking about earlier with labor, if you're going to be paying somebody to do this, I chose $12 an hour because I can pay a teenager or a kid one who lives in my house, $12 to do this, and it'll be roughly about what they're going to get at McDonald's. They might even make more at McDonald's, but uh, they don't have to pay taxes at my house. So um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, I'm not talking about taxes, but the uh, $12 an hour to add that, you're talking, and, and this, right, this is talking about the additional cost, the difference from the full time system. So. Again, experience matters, and how you set it up in your pasture matters. You can be adding anywhere from seven to fifteen or seven to fourteen cents here per pound per year. Um, well, actually, per batch here to to do a day ranging system. 
And like I said, this can be very context dependent because you could do a lot of things to change these numbers, right? You could just be better at chickens. You could choose not to have such a nice chicken tractor or an expensive chicken tractor. You could do just a shade shelter, right? So if you did a shade shelter that only cost you $100, you're going to change it. And you wrote it down here. It's, it's five cents per pound less if you're going to just reduce the cost of that tractor, right? Um, so I, I, uh, I have enough to say about that. It's day rangers can be can be competitive with a full timer, and even a a uh, even a freedom ranger can be competitive with a corner. So it just depends on on all well, a lot of different factors actually. So I mean, you can see here that you can do day rangers in the spring. Uh, for possibly cheaper than you can do a Cornish in the spring. Uh, and once you add in all of your other costs here, it's possible that you could even uh, you know, choose to do a uh, Freedom Ranger in the fall and be very competitive with a Cornish cost in the spring. So, uh, conclusion, when I was a PhD student, my advisor said the first conclusion to any talk is that it needs more research and funding. Uh, so I'd love it if other people wanted to carry the torch here on what we've done. Um, day ranging, it could be better for your farm. It is possible. I think a lot of it could be personal in that you want to, uh, you want to have three range birds from a purely economic uh, standpoint. It's going to take some, it's going to take some work to get them close, right? Um, but if you can market that to your customers, you can certainly come out ahead uh, doing uh, a different system. So, in general, pasture poultry, I think is, you know, we're certainly going to continue doing it. Like, I think Tom asked, we're going to try the Freedom Rangers again. I don't think we'll do day ranging. If we do, we're definitely going to do it in the fall, um, where it's a little bit more advantageous. Um, and. There's too many things going on the farm in the spring. Sometimes we move in too many fences. So, yeah, that's it. Uh, hopefully there's no one sleeping like this guy is. <laughs> appreciate uh, you listening. Thanks a lot. That's a really good piece of work, Rick.